सकते जी गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन थैंक यू वेरी मच ऑनरेबल रेगे कमिश्नर अली शुमा बिशप रोड्रिगो माई कोलीग फ्रॉम द मीडिया एंड द गुड प्रोफेसर्स एंड स्कॉलर्स हु मेड दिस रिसर्च a success i think for me this is really a telling moment of trying to assess where we are uh good progress in terms of trying to assess what the media has done for this country where it goes beyond the borders and where it can be better let me congratulate uh the people who took part in this research uh some of them are my colleagues have seen them here uh thank you very much for doing a good job if it was my if it were my recommendation i would have asked elias mokua and company to concentrate more on what kenyan media has done rather than to run away and profile what cnn bbc Al Jazeera and the international media are doing in regard to conflict but i think there are still prime lessons for our local media or kenyan media houses that we can borrow from uh, the experiences of such research and uh, reportage from those international um media houses i'll begin by introducing myself Uh, a little more to those who may not be familiar with myself my name is david ohito uh, i have been a journalist for 20 and interrupted years serving in the newsroom every single day i wake up except when i am forced to come and talk to scholars like here now um i'm also personally very engaged in terms of fighting for media freedom in this country uh, i'm one of the advocates uh, for free and independent media Uh, in this country because it stands out as a pillar for democracy but the subject today is very interesting uh, i did not have formal notes i'm not a researcher of uh, scholarly levels but um i have been forced to scribble some few notes and in terms of reportage of conflict in whose interest does media work that's a very pertinent question and um for you to understand in whose interest the media works we must find out who owns the particular medium why is it that we can stand at catholic university today with one of the hugest following across the globe but even in vatican they would still switch off and watch bbc cnn al jazeera in kenya the lord bishops would still watch ktn and not media owned by the catholics it tells you that the media practitioners have something more to offer for you to consume but traditionally there have been consumption habits but these are changing by the day because of technology the way we used to read the newspaper 20 years ago the way we do it today is very different and i am one of those advocates or critics who do not believe in what my good friend muluka said that the media influences the voters in a particular way take a case study of kenya we have four new daily newspapers all put together they still don't circulate more than 600,000 copies of the newspaper kenya has about 14 million voters do the extra math even if each paper was being read by 10 people you still would not reach 14 million people so how is it that the media tries to influence uh, the voter i think for me those should be subjects of next level of research um today wherever i sit as i work on the digital platforms i'm the online editor and proud to say that i'm the editor of the biggest news platform in eastern central africa in terms of traffic and that is how i'm judged how many people come to the site how many stay there and these are scientifically verifiable data um which can be 
accessed should you request. But how is a successful editor measured? How is a successful media house measured today? How is a successful journalist measured? Today, we have moved away from the traditional ways of measuring. The editors have lost the independence they had, the influence they had. They have gone to be measured in terms of how much returns they make in terms of sales, in terms of circulation. May I take the opportunity to welcome my good friend and new source, Honorable Kiraitu Murungi, Senator of Meru. Shall we applaud him, please? Thank you, Mwashimiwa. Um, as I continue to look at Uh, I, I was just looking at how we try to measure a successful editor today from where I sit. That we are measured more by the number of newspapers I sell, by the biggest circulation or audiences that we engage. And that has an impact on what content you bring to your audiences and how these audiences interact with the content you have brought forth. So, Irrespective of the subject, whether HIV AIDS, whether devolution, whether legislation or conflict, it depends on how competitive you can remain, what age you can have against your competitors and rivals to stay on course. Do we over-sensationalize? Sometimes, yes, to satisfy the needs of audiences. As an editor, I think we owe it to the audiences. And the audiences today are very practical. The moment you give them what they don't want to consume, they simply flip the channel or get out of that story if it is online or simply abandon your newspaper. So to say that we sensationalize sometimes, very much agreed. If the, we looked at the case of um, Narok the other day when uh, the, the two politicians were Huggling over devolution and the funds allocation. I mean, that was news. Because if we gave you the flip side of that, nobody would have watched that channel. But if you go even online to prove this, the number of clips that have been replayed about the same incident is much more than the number of development stories that followed that story. So it tells you how consumer habits keep on changing and how conflict has remained a major subject for all media, local and international. If you sample CNN or BBC Al Jazeera today, in the morning when you wake up, you'll hear of the battle in Ukraine, you'll hear of ISIS war, you'll hear of Middle, uh, Middle East crisis, Israeli, Palestinians, you'll hear of Syria, and then our good friends who are seeking independence in Scotland would come item five or six and it tells you conflict as a subject still resonates very well with the audiences that we serve. Um, I want to give a few examples of covering conflicts in the Kenyan case. It has become very difficult. Some of the conflicts have even metamorphosized to engage terror, and terror has become a new subject for journalists in Kenya, very difficult to cover because I know of no editor who has military training or who has training on IEDs, explosives, the power of guns, and so on. So these are new territories that editors continue to confront every morning as they try to get the best stories for you or for the audiences. But in trying to do so, it's also very difficult because Averagely, the top story, and Yang Kim, who was a TV editor here, will tell you, Nation, Standard, uh, uh, KTN, KBC, three minutes, that's the top story. So to package a full conflict story, well-balanced, well-sourced, well-argued, well-narrated within three minutes is no easy task. 
you have crew who have been filming, say, Westgate for six hours, and you're supposed to get a story of three minutes out of it. There's a lot of brain work, a lot of professional input that goes into it. And there's also the danger of trying to balance rights and responsibilities of people. And which brings me to the big challenge of the big nation picture, which caused a lot of uproar here. And I stand here to defend my colleagues, editors, that nation had every right to publish that photograph. If it did not resonate with the audiences, then ask yourself the big question that that same photograph has won two internationally most respected awards today. So was the editor wrong or was he right? If you ask me, the editor was very right. I'll give another example. When we had a um, fire incident in Sinai, uh, I think then again the good senator, my friend, was the Minister for Energy, uh, the petroleum fire outbreak in Sinai. Uh, Nation and Standard tried to be so-called very professional and did not show any gory images of the bodies or the deaths that occurred. Instead, they just published figures. But the following day, the Star newspaper published charred remains on page one, a very big color picture. And in the streets, the stars sold out. And people were saying on the streets that he national standard woman in Liwana Serikali. So the audiences went for that gory image. And it brings us to a very difficult question. When should we publish what kind of picture and for what kind of audience? And how much time does an editor have on his hand to try and do this balance and sell the product and still keep his job as the best circulating editor or the best managing editor in town? Very difficult questions to manage. Going forward, how has media tried to adjust to cover conflict effectively, efficiently, and professionally? Uh, previously, we had very bad blood with uh, the security forces. But today, we have gained some ground. We get embedded in KDF operations, both in Kenya and outside the country. Somalia has been a very good case where journalists have been uh, carried on board. But how independent would be a journalist when he is embedded with the K within the KDF forces? Shall he say that? KDF was fired at and four, office, uh, four officers who didn't have the right gear, for example, were shot at and killed. Those are begging professional questions that I'll challenge next researchers to engage in. Uh, the coverage of Baragoy, Mpeketoni, Wajia, Mandera recently, and currently also, Lamu, have also posed very difficult um, experiences for journalists and editors covering these areas. How far do we tell the truth? How far do we tell the story without necessarily inflaming uh, factions that are in conflict? If it were you to produce the head, uh, headline, after criticizing us, I have not seen the alternatives you have given us, Muluka, in your research, that if Raila attacked Uhuru and Uhuru hit back, you have not given me a single alternative headline that I would sell to my audiences. If researchers would find such alternative headlines, then I would really encourage them going forward. Um, there are also challenges in terms of coverage of conflicts, in terms of limitations to freedoms of expression on grounds of national security. A case study was the uh, Westgate when it was sealed off and uh, the media was accused of trying to show or expose strategies that our security officers were implementing to try and deal with terrorists. But out there, the audiences were expecting us to tell them what happened minute by minute. And believe you me, the challenges and competition for mainstream media have tripled over time. Today, news is not broken by media houses but by individual or citizen journalists, as we call them, that the first images I published as online editor of Westgate were from smartphones that you and me own. And that shows you how media has changed, technology has changed the way 
information is relayed, how information is uh, consumed as well. So today, before you even see story breaking on news platforms, uh, your friends have shared with you on Facebook, on Twitter, on other social media platforms, and the independence and monopoly of news by news media houses is long gone. Today, your grandmother at 75 with a smartphone can take an award-winning photograph, things that could not happen just 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, finally, Jan uh, Kim asks here, how far has commercialization of media uh, impacted the work of editors and journalists? And I would say, by repeating my first remarks, that we have since lost the independence we enjoyed, that we are measured more by the monies we bring in and not by the best stories we have sold. Uh, it is becoming increasingly difficult to sometimes criticize the government. Sometimes the advertisers, the government accounts for 40% of advertisement revenue in newspapers, both nation standard today. So when you hit hard on Jubilee or hit hard on the Grand Coalition, the reaction is that we will stop advertising with you. And that alone is enough to scare the editor or the journalist to stop pursuing what is perceived to be hostile stories against this government ministries or functionaries or institutions. Um, it is almost impossible to criticize Safaricom, Airtel, uh, previously used to be Kenya breweries, all the big brands that you see advertising, not only in Kenya but across the globe. You'll never see those negative stories about Coca-Cola, and the internationally respected brands. It's almost impossible. So that has really limited the freedom to express issues which may be uh, hostile or perceived to be um, criticizing the big spenders in advertising revenue. Um, whenever we have been accused of reporting or carrying bad images that uh, inflame tensions, I always invite those who say so to visit media houses. If you look at the 2007-2008 um, clashes, if somebody would ever detail what we did not show the public, then you'd really side with the editors. We still have those pictures in archives. We don't know who to give them or how to make re revenue out of them because we are asked to make revenue for every work we do. I think they belong to the museums. One day, somebody else uh, might, 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 might find where best to archive them. But there's a lot that we do in terms of gatekeeping, trying to keep our audiences safe from those unwarranted images. Um, I want to end by saying that conflict remains a key subject of debate, research, and even coverage and reportage in media, and which is why you see those headlines still making um, headlines. But which also explains why there is never a peace TV station or radio station that we would compare with the global media. If peace was to be a major subject in reportage, then we would see one such station competing the big names, both locally and internationally. Uh, but going forward, I will also recommend that um, we have new uh, frontiers of conflict coverage, as I mentioned earlier, which include terror. There are new terminologies which are coming to the newsrooms, which are not familiar with journalists. And I don't know, uh, Catholic University communication students, whether there is anybody training on uh, other than the theories of conflict coverage and so on any attempt to try and cover real-time challenging stories of conflict like terror. We had very big challenges in newsroom dis distinguishing between an IED, a rifle, an armored personnel carrier, and all these military term terminologies. 
it was very difficult even for some of the journalists to identify the ranks of the top military officers who came to address the media. Uh, going forward, I would recommend that there must be tailored training to try and capture new forms of conflict that continue to emerge in our society. Otherwise, uh, I'll be happy to feed one, two, three questions. And most of my colleagues who are listed have been unable to turn up. But uh, thank you very much for giving me the chance to share with you my few ideas. Thank you very much.